It's dark tonight in this holy city, in this place of kings, in this land that sometimes feels like the center of the universe. It's been destroyed already before and it's been rebuilt. It's been besieged two dozen times and yet it remains. It's been captured and attacked and ransacked, but tonight it stands a marvel, a wonder of the world. Sages write that whoever has not seen it in its splendor has never seen a fine city. But tonight, it's more than fine. It's living up to what its name means, the city of peace, Jerusalem. Right now, we're at the foot of one of the peaks in a ridge that runs for about two miles east of the city. And just over there, some of Jerusalem's most important citizens have found their final resting place in a graveyard on the Mount of Olives. A city of the dead in the city of peace. Tonight, they sleep, but if they could watch, they would see a man and his three closest companions in the world approaching, walking into a garden to pray. They might recognize these men. The group had made a custom of coming into the garden when they needed a place of solitude and reflection. So to these long sleeping Israelites, the men passing by them would have been familiar. But some of the more savvy of them might notice something more because when they were alive, they would have heard stories about tonight. They might have even told stories themselves about the man walking in the front, about a deliverer who was to come, a Messiah who was on the way, a son born to suffer and to save. But tonight, he came to pray. The little grove is called Gethsemane, which means oil press, but someone passing by tonight might mistake the praying man for one of the olives that gets squeezed and, gro and ground down and spilled out like the oil that gave the garden its name. It's dark tonight in the holy city, in this city of peace. But you don't need a light to see the anguish in this man's face or to see the sweat falling from his brow. Or is it blood? If you could get close enough to him, you might hear what he was saying in a voice like one staring at the gallows, Abba, Father, Dad, you would hear. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. You would have heard him tell the men he came with to keep watch because it is dark tonight in the holy city and there is something coming on the wind. You would have heard him ask the men he came with why they were sleeping when he told them to stay awake because the time for rest was over. There was something coming up just over the ridge. You would have heard him stand before them a third time and tell them that the hour had come at last because that's when they came for him to arrest him. Oh, the perfect son of God in all his innocence You're walking in the dirt with you and me He knows what living is He's acquainted with our grief A man of sorrow, son of sorrow own blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for Smell is one of the most powerful senses that humans have. It's the reason we can taste things. It's one of the primary ways that we know whether food is safe to eat. And smell has a way of reminding us of the past and connecting to a core memory. 
just a few hours before Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He and 12 of his disciples were in a room surrounded by the scents and the flavors of Passover. Roasted lamb with bitter herbs to remember the Passover sacrifice. Hereset, a sweet dish from apples, spices, and nuts to remember the bricks the Israelites made in their slavery in Egypt. Unleavened bread to remember their quick, stealthy flight from their captors. And wine to celebrate their freedom. Peter, one of Jesus' 12 apostles and a member of Jesus' inner circle, woke from his accidental nap in Gethsemane to see his friend, his companion, his brother, Judas, betray his master. His clothes probably still smelled like the fire he used to prepare the Passover supper they had just eaten. And that smell probably reminded him of what Jesus had told him just hours before Judas kissed Jesus on the cheek. He said, tonight, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And that smell probably reminded him of his reply. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. How delicate the promises made by mortal men. As a crowd of priests, teachers of the law, elders, and their friend Judas, all of them armed with swords and clubs, led Jesus away. Peter, smelling his robe and remembering his promise, leapt to action. But if they were going to take his Lord, they were going to have to go through him first. Unsheathing his sword, he swung for the high priest's servant. After all, this is Peter, the impulsive one, the first out of the boat to stand on the water Jesus walked on. The first to tie his cloak up and run when he sees Jesus in the distance. Peter gauged the threat that night in Gethsemane, and he was willing to neutralize it with steel. Peter was determined to keep his promise. But how delicate are the promises made by mortal men. As the crowd led Jesus away, Peter kept his distance. He stalked the group from the shadows. He wove through the city as they paraded Jesus through it to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, where in the courtyard below, there was a distinctive scent of a charcoal fire. It was dark that night in the holy city. And it was around April, so it was cold outside. But as Peter approached the fire to keep warm, a servant girl followed him. And in the light, she recognized him. You, you were with him, she said. Woman, Peter said, I don't know him. There was more commotion than usual at this hour, so people were pretty on edge, and a few began to notice the confrontation happening by the light source in the courtyard. Another person chimed in, looking Peter in the face. You're one of them. I wonder if he could see the blood on Peter's cloak from his burst of violence earlier. Man, I am not, Peter replied. He could see what laid wait for Jesus. He saw how serious the morning had become. He could hear the accusatory tone of their voices. He could hear snippets of conversation about what was to happen next. Flogging, humiliation, crucifixion. He didn't want to leave Jesus on his own, but the situation was getting dire. He was running out of time. More people were waking up and the crowd was gathering. Just one week ago, when his master got to town, these same people were lining the streets and shouting, Hosanna, save us. But now, they were getting restless. They were preparing the wooden beams on which his king would expire. Peter had denied Jesus twice already, but now it was his turn to be betrayed, this time by his own voice, by the accent that propelled his words into the gathering crowd. Certainly this guy was with him. He had to be. He talks just like Jesus did. He pronounces words the same way. This man is a Galilean. He has to be one of them. And Peter, smelling the charcoal burning and keeping him warm, the smoke settling into the fibers in the only cloak he owned. Crown back. Man, 
I do not know what you're talking about. And then, as if an echo bouncing off the courtyard walls came back to his ear, he heard the rooster crow. The smell of Peter's betrayal by the courtyard fire mixed with the smell of the supper they just eaten, the supper where Jesus had told him that he loved him, even though he knew what Peter would say, even though he knew what Peter was going to do, even when Peter would betray with his voice, just like Judas did with a kiss. next out for someone as far beneath us as an itinerant rabbi who doesn't even have a place to sleep. That's what Pilate thought when a crowd showed up with Jesus in front of his house that Friday morning. He thought himself a reasonable guy who was pretty good at getting things done, finding a way forward, at compromising. It's why he'd been stationed there at his post in the first place by his boss, Tiberius, the emperor. But here he was the peacekeeping prefect staring down a bloodied man and listening to an increasingly agitated crowd shouting about how badly this man needed to die. The crowd in front of his house wasn't any normal collection of people. When he'd come into power, there was kind of an agreement between the Romans and the Jews. As long as they kept in line and didn't raise any anti-Rome rabble, the Jewish Sanhedrin could handle Jewish affairs. Pay your taxes, don't stage uprisings, stay out of each other's way. That was good enough for the emperor and so it was good enough for Pilate. But today, Pilate's back was against the wall. This man that they called Jesus had already stood in front of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, exactly as it should be. This should have been out of Pilate's purview. But now, the problem was very much in Pilate's purview because Jesus was standing in his living room. Pilate pulled some Jewish officials aside. What did you say this guy did again? They said, would we have handed him over to you if he hadn't done something worth dying for? The riddles, Pilate probably thought. Fine, then take him away and judge him by your own laws. We can't, they said. We don't have the right. Only Romans can execute someone. Pilate wasn't supposed to be here. He should have been at his home. Prefects only came in during festivals to keep an eye on all the people gathering to prevent insurrection from spreading like mold. He'd already squashed one insurrection. Those responsible, especially that murderer Barabbas, were scheduled to be killed today as a matter of fact. But this was not an insurrection. Pilate felt no threat toward Rome, particularly because of what he'd been told Jesus had done. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. So what, Pilate probably thought. He may be their king, but he is not their emperor. This doesn't matter to me. So he went back inside and asked his questions. Minutes later, Pilate came back out and stood next to Jesus and said, I find no basis for a charge against this man. That was not the right answer for the crowd, demanding Jesus' blood. So Pilate sent Jesus up the chain to the ruler of Judea named Herod. Sometimes this is what we do. We try to absolve ourselves of guilt by passing the responsibility onto someone else. 
so that we can say that our hands are clean. Herod was a famously unstable man, but even he couldn't find a fault in Jesus worth killing for. If Jesus were this king of the Jews, Herod would have had the most to lose because that was sort of his job. But Herod heard what the chief priests and teachers of the law were saying and simply couldn't square it away with the man that was standing before him. They teased Jesus for it, mocked him, put a nicer robe on him than he'd ever owned in his life. But Herod, like Pilate, couldn't find anything in Jesus worth killing for. So Jesus returned to Pilate who said to the increasingly outraged crowd, you brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for the charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. The crowd would have it. They told Pilate that if he was going to release anyone, it should be Barabbas, the murderous revolutionary. Whipped into a frenzy, the crowd began to shout, crucify. They wouldn't be satisfied until Jesus, silent as a whisper on the wind, was dead. But being dead wouldn't be enough. He had to be beaten first. When Pilate, annoyed, turned Jesus over to them, that's exactly what they did. They led Jesus in the morning sun into the guards' headquarters. They stripped him naked. They twisted together a crown of thorns, pressed it into his scalp. They flogged him 40 times with a whip that had nine tails, each tail threaded with hooks and tipped with a lead ball to make sure that the hooks grabbed onto the flesh. Unrecognizable as a human being, Jesus then marched, carrying the splintered beam on which he would die up a hill called Golgotha, the skull. See, this is what we do. This is who we are. We take beautiful things and we destroy them. We devise newer and cooler ways of hurting each other. We invent reasons why our fellow image bearers have less of a right to the things that we have than we do, and we justify it however we can. And Jesus knew it. He understood what we were. He knew what he was walking into. He knew the weight that he was going to carry. And he came and he carried it anyway. Because that's what he does. That's who he is. He's the son of God made flesh. The son of man made sacrifice. The son of suffering who turns the cheek and showers the scandal of grace. Upon his murderers. Oh, blood and tears, how can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, and don't praise the one who would reach for. methods of execution that humans have invented that can rival crucifixion for his cruelty. Today, in most places in the world, when we execute a criminal, we extend them whatever basic dignity can come to a person about to be executed. We offer a last meal. We offer a chance to say a few final words, a quick, painless death. There is no dignity at all in what we did to Jesus on that cross. Through the years, we've softened the blow of crucifixion. We've cleaned it up some. 
We buy little trinkets that show a man on a cross, but that's not what this kind of death would have looked like because it is difficult to imagine a sinless man enduring something like what happened to him on the place called the skull. He was completely naked, entirely exposed. Whatever clothes he had were torn up and gambled over, not because they were worth a lot of money, but because it is a bitter irony to see your final possessions go not to the people you will them to, not to the people you want to have them, but to whoever chance says should take them. He was suffering from intense blood loss to the point that this man who was used to working with his hands couldn't even carry his beam up the hill by himself. They had to pull somebody out of the crowd to carry it for him. Not one of his friends, but a stranger who likely showed up simply to see the spectacle of the day. He was fixed to a cross, like most victims of crucifixion were, with ropes around his arms, probably at his elbows, to hold his hands in place while they prepared the spikes that came next. These nails weren't for his hands. Those bones and that skin were, were too small and thin. They couldn't bear the weight without ripping. And so they would have been driven one blow after another in between the bones of his forearms. Down at his feet, they would have been his legs, almost like he was kneeling, almost like he would have been kneeling in prayer the night that they found him. A third nail staked his feet to the beam underneath him so that when the cross was raised, he had to push against the nail to relieve the pressure from his arms if he wanted to breathe. And then the dying would start. Death by crucifixion was not like a death from beating or blood loss. It was a death by the panic of suffocation. Because of the way his arms were stretched out at his side and the way the weight was hanging off of them, each time he wanted to take a breath, he would have had to push up with his legs using the last remaining strength in the finite amount of strength left in his body. This is what we do. We, the species of creation formed from the dust of the ground by the hand of the Almighty, just couldn't help ourselves. We turned killing and cruelty and pain into an art and we used it on the word of God made flesh. When most of these people first met this word of God made flesh, it was with an announcement from a wild man in the wilderness, a prophet wearing scratchy camel hair, eating locusts and preaching about repentance. He looked at Jesus and he said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now, on the weekend of Passover, the weekend the Israelites celebrated their escape from bondage in Egypt by the blood of lambs painted across the wooden beams in their door frames, the blood of the Lamb of God ran down the wooden beam on which he would die. And then for the second time in the day, but this time somewhat unexpectedly, it was dark in the holy city. At about noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which was, not, which was not Hebrew or Greek. It was the tongue he was born speaking, Aramaic. And it means this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt that? This is not a trick question. I want to know, have you ever felt abandoned by God? Betrayed by your friends, mistreated, discarded, denied? Have you ever felt the darkness rolling in like a slow fog at noon? Have you felt the clouds of despair forming over your head? Have you felt trapped, tapped out, and alone? The son of suffering wants you to know that he knows what it feels like. He has looked death in the face and it made him weep. He has felt the weight of loss and the pressure of hopelessness and he wants you to know that you are not alone because you have to remember that the son of suffering was also a rabbi he was a teacher my god my god why have you forsaken me it was an expression of how he felt of the reality of the situation but it was not the end of the story because he wasn't just saying words that he made up 
He was beginning a lesson the way any rabbi would. He and rabbis like him would have done something similar. They would quote something familiar to their students so that their students could remember the lesson that came along with it. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, he was beginning his final lesson. With his dying breaths, he quoted Psalm 22. You see, he felt the beginning, but he wanted you and I to remember the end. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules. Jesus took his final painful gasping breaths to remind you that in hopelessness, in desperation, in the deepest pit humans can devise, there is in the pain of suffering and death. There is more and better to come. In the darkness of the holy city, there is light. But for Jesus, first, there was death. With a loud voice, Jesus cried out again, a final shout, one last sound, one remaining sign of light, of life before the light of the world was snuffed out. The ground began to shake. The curtain of the temple separated the, that separated the presence of God from the court of the people, split in half from top to bottom. Tombs spilled open. The hillside of the Mount of Olives filled with centuries of sleeping Israelites opened and bore witness to the one they would have seen going into the garden as he met them where they once were, in the city of the dead, just outside the city of peace. Because if someone was going to conquer death, first, he had to die. He took the full force of human brutality. He felt the full wave of despair because he was separated from God. He saw the moment that it seemed that darkness was stronger than the light. And so the son of God, the son of suffering, died.
church me sing it sing I trust in God he's my savior the one who will never fail he will never fail I trust in God my savior Crazy.
dark today in the holy city, in this place of kings, in this land that sometimes feels like the center of the universe. Because today, it is. Something has changed forever. Two lines running through history have met and collided and the shockwave from that collision would reach throughout time. The wickedness of man and the goodness of God. See, the wickedness of man led us here. It stumbled us to this point. It soaked the streets in bitterness and blood and tears. But the goodness of God met us in the middle of what we had made. He broke into his own story. He put on flesh and dwelled among us. The perfection of the divine living in the middle of the brokenness of man. Becoming the brokenness of man. The light of the world snuffed out by the brokenness of man. And it is so dark tonight in the holy city. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me Friday, um, the night before Jesus gathered the disciples for what we call the, the Last Supper. And as they are gathered there together, Jesus is betrayed, Judas leaves, and he creates this really sacred moment, this sacred memorial that we call communion, the Lord's Supper. And we read in 1 Corinthians 11, the story of that night, the apostle Paul says this, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. A few things that I would like to prepare you for as we enter this time of uh, taking the Lord's Supper together. Um, You'll see there's tables in 
the front of each aisle. And um, in just a moment, we're gonna ask you to get up out of your seat and go to each one of those tables and, and uh, take a piece of bread and, and the juice and, and take it back to your seat and um, have a moment with the Lord in prayer and, and, and take it on your own. Um, but I wanna remind you what the whole point is. Jesus tells us to remember him, remember the broken body, remember the blood that was spilled out for the sins of man. Friday, that good Friday, was a day of pain. It was a day of physical pain. Jesus was beaten, he was whipped, he was spit upon, he was slapped, they plucked his beard out of his face just to be cruel. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They scourged him, which was whipping him 40 times. He would have been barely alive as he was taken to the cross that day. He had had no sleep. He had had no food, no water to our knowledge. And so this crucifixion was the worst torture a man could experience. They say that dying on the cross was really death by suffocation. That's why they would break the legs of, of people on the cross so that they could no longer lift up and actually breathe. Good Friday is about pain. Jesus endured it. It was also about emotional pain. When you think of his death, he was humiliated, sinless, never sinned one single moment in his life, did not deserve this cross, naked, for all to watch him just suffer and die in front of them on the cross. He experienced the pain of reje uh, rejection from his disciples. He is experiencing just uh, the, the ugly side of sin. Imagine the 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 sin and the guilt of every crime, every sin in humanity being placed upon him in that moment, all throughout history, on him at that moment. First Peter 2, 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus told us with communion to remember the broken body and the blood that was spilled. When we remember that, when we truly think about it as we are tonight, when we think about the physical pain, the emotional pain, the embarrassment, when we, when we truly let our hearts begin to settle in on what was happening on the cross, it should lead us to gratitude. And so in communion, yes, we remember the broken body and blood and then we are grateful. And so a million times over, hallelujah, a million times over, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my, my, my family members who know you. Thank you for rescuing me. We're reminded of where we used to be and where we are today. And it should bring a brand new song to our mouth. It should, should make us sing louder. It should make us overcome the, the, the discouraging parts of our, our day and our life today because of what Christ has done in us and for us, it leads us to gratitude. And Jesus also told us to examine ourselves when we take communion. And so that means that it's a time for us to think about and, and have Him bring to our mind any sin that is breaking relationships around us today. Is there anything in our life that we're holding on to uh, sin-wise? Is there anything in our life that we're refusing to turn from or to repent of? And as the Lord brings those to our mind, we take communion to examine our hearts. And those things come to our mind and we confess them. And it might be the one millionth time you've confessed it, but we confess it again and we turn from it again. And we plead for God's help to, to not only um, overcome it, but continue to run from it. So there's a moment in this uh, sacred time when you get the bread and the juice and go back to your seat to spend time in prayer, being grateful, remembering, and yes, examining. And then finally, Jesus is, is also telling us in this scripture 
something I think is important. He's saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so there's another piece that is in communion. We are looking ahead. We're looking ahead. You know, Good Friday has a, has a, has a good famous name. Sunday has a good famous name, Easter, but Saturday is kind of like, I mean, it's, it's the day in between. We don't really, Catholics call it Holy Week. We don't really do much with that Saturday, but I, I, I want to kind of make a comparison here. When you think about at this point in the day, 2000 some odd years ago, Jesus is dead, his body is taken. The disciples are now hiding, they're alone, they're afraid. They wake up on Saturday, still afraid, hiding, confused. I mean, just imagine you've spent three years with this, with this person, you've seen him do miracles, you've seen him uh, preach and teach and say things and do things that blew your mind on an everyday basis. You're excited, you're passionate, you're energetic with, with, with being with Jesus and then he's gone. It's just over. I mean, it's, it's hard for us to exp like really grasp how, how just like a bomb must have just gone off in their mind and in their heart and they're afraid and it's Saturday and they don't know what's gonna happen next and they are waiting. And so I would, I, would, I would think of Saturday and encourage you to think of Saturday as a day of waiting. Just like the disciples are waiting and they're trying to figure out what is next for you and I, we know the end of the story. We know Sunday is coming. We know uh, the, the tomb is empty. And so yes, we, we have salvation. Christ has changed our lives. Like we live for him today, we have his promise, but there's also, there's, there's also this, this, this idea of what theologians call the already but not yet. And what that means is we already know the grace of Jesus. We already know the joy of salvation. We already know the forgiveness of our sins. We already know the promise of heaven. And so there's a sense in which, yes, we are already enjoying so many great things about our relationship with Christ and our salvation. And then there's also this sense that there is yet more to come. There is way more to come. What is more to come is a glorified body, eternal life, peace on earth, new creation, new heavens, new earth. And you and I, in this season of our life, we are waiting for Jesus to return. The waiting period of yes, we know Jesus is a re resurrected. Yes, we have found freedom. Yes, we have the promise of heaven. So in one sense, we are experiencing the joy of knowing Jesus. But in the other sense, there is more to come. Already, but not yet fully fulfilled. And that should give us hope. When we come to communion, we remember, we are grateful, right? We examine and then we look ahead and we fix our eyes on Jesus. We're waiting for him to return. We're waiting for him to make all things new. We're waiting for him to defeat Satan, conquer evil. And while we wait, we're gonna go through some good times. We're gonna go through some bad times. We're gonna watch the world go into various wars. We're gonna see various famines and pandemics and we're going to see politicians do terrible things and we're going to see evil people continue to wreak havoc on the world and we're going to uh, be afraid at times and we're going to uh, be upset at times and we might even be potentially depressed at times and we've got to come back to the promise that Jesus gave us and every communion is an opportunity for us to do that to look ahead he said in this world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world so remember, as often as you eat of the bread, as often as you take of the cup, do so in remembrance of me. Our section leaders can go ahead and remove the covers and uh, there's, no <clears throat> there's no like organized way to do this in a large room like this and so we just wanted it to just feel organic and just kind of natural and just worshipful. And so um, just come up, grab 
grab some, grab, grab the juice, grab the bread, and then make your way back uh, to the seat. Um, and uh, we'll take our time doing this. And as we do this, we'll just continue to play music and, and um, we'll give you guys an opportunity uh, to take communion. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross. And as we, as a church, take communion, we remember the broken body of Jesus, the blood that was spilled for our sin. And we are grateful and we are thankful. And to that, we say amen. Lord, we confess our sin to you. And we look forward to the day when you will make all things new, when we will feast in heaven at the King's table. Bless our church and our worship now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and start to make our way.
Jesus didn't have a place to sleep. So he certainly couldn't afford a place to sleep forever. His apostles who couldn't even afford the tax to get into the temple, couldn't either. But after Jesus died, another of his disciples, a man named Joseph, traveled from Arimathea, knocked on Pilate's door, and flashed a purse of gold. His offer was simple. He had no ulterior motive, no selfishness, no final gambit to try to gain an advantage. He simply wanted his rabbi's body so that he could bury it. Pilate ordered that Jesus' body should be given to him. And so Joseph did some basic preparations. He wrapped Jesus' broken body mercifully in new, clean linen. He carried it to the tomb that he had cut out of a rock, probably the tomb that he intended for himself. And that's where Jesus, the life gone from his face, the gentleness sat from his eyes, laid. But that wasn't good enough for Jesus' killers. They approached Pilate and told him that Jesus himself said that death wasn't going to be able to hold him. They thought that his disciples were going to raid the tomb and take Jesus' body and make it look like he had come back to life. They were worried about what would happen if people thought that he was actually alive. They were afraid of what would happen to their control, to their systems, to their power, if people thought that Jesus could conquer the final enemy, death. So with Pilate's permission, they rolled a stone in front of the cold tomb. They sealed it in place with grout and cement, and they posted guards in front of it. That's where, in the cold, in the dark, alone. Surrounded by drama and shrouded in suspicion and truly, unmistakably gone, Jesus, Son of God, Son of Mary, Son of Suffering, laid. <laughs> 